preaching time. The pinnacle of every worship experience, that of the holy and divine priest word. We are honored and blessed tonight to have one of the baddest preachers in the world with us on tonight. Amen. I didn't say this before, but when I thought about the Fall Classic Revival, the first person that I thought about was Dr. Cynthia L. Hale. Amen? She was the first phone call that I made, and whatever her schedule was, everybody else had to work around it. Somebody holler back at me now. But I am honored tonight uh, to share her with the Rodman Street Church family and to the greater Pittsburgh community, uh, one of my mentors. When I was in seminary and a struggling uh, young pastor, she was one of my greatest mentors, someone who would take me on trips uh, because my church budget would not allow it, so we could go out to California and go to conferences, and you never forget that. And I thank God that some 20 years later that she and I are still friends, amen? amen. She just celebrated 25 years as the senior pastor of the Ray of Hope Christian Church, amen. amen. Now, we all know she don't look much over 25, amen? Amen. But we thank God, certainly thank God for her. And she's certainly a model, uh, not only to uh, females, but she's a model to males. God has blessed her ministry to grow by leaps and bounds uh, with men and women and young adults, amen? amen? But also, what I really love about her, that she is the quintessent uh, fem female. She doesn't try to be manly in everything, Amen. And that's a good model for our other female preachers to know that you can still be who you are and allow God to push his way through you. So I thank God for that. And uh, as I said, she is the senior pastor of the Ray of Hope Christian Church in Decatur, Georgia, uh, where she serves thousands every week. Uh, the gospel uh, preacher. Uh, she is a woman who loves God. She's an innovator. She's a visionary. And she is someone who God has truly blessed. And I thank God that she has come tonight to be a blessing uh, to this entire community. Amen? Amen. Amen. I would like for all the ministers and all the pastors to stand so that Dr. Hill can see how many clergy persons we have out here on tonight. Amen. Amen. After another selection. From our guest choir, the next voice that we would hear would be Dr. Cynthia L. Hale, the senior pastor and my mentor of the Ray of Hope Christian Church. Amen. Let's greet her by saying, preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Amen.
the other pastors and ministers and people of God, officers and persons who serve here and attend here at the Rodman Street, the Street Missionary Baptist Church of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. What a joy it is for me to be here with you and my good friend of 20 years. It is hard to believe that we have known each other that long. And when I saw him, I hugged him. I said, you look just like the young boy who came to seminary. <laughs> Cantler School of Theology. Not everybody can get in Cantler School of Theology. You don't get in Cantler School of Theology because you got good looks. You got to have a call of God upon your life. And then you've got to have the gifts. And uh, Dr. Kennedy's gifts have made room for him. His good gifts and his good looks and his good sense got him a wife like the Reverend Trina. Hallelujah. When I met him, he was single, but he wooed this woman. One of the best things that he's ever done in life. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, sisters, you know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. And the brothers do too. Amen. What a joy it is also. I haven't met her yet, but I understand that this is Trina's mother, Mrs. Jacqueline Smith. And so it is so good to see you tonight as well. And good to see some of my brothers and sisters from Mount Arad Baptist Church, where I was a month ago. Amen. I'm always delighted to be in Pittsburgh. I was in Pittsburgh, first of all, with the Disciples of Christ some 12, 13 years ago. And I didn't know that you had all these black folks in. <laughs> Disciples of Christ are a predominantly white denomination. Amen. And I'm also delighted to see that black folks and white folks worship together here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the church. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. There is no difference in us. We are all one people. My, 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 my. I want to be.
thank the Ministry of Music for blessing us as well. I can't believe this is a Presbyterian church. Y'all don't sound like the Presbyterians I know. <laughs> Everybody got Holy Ghost up in here. Hallelujah. <laughs> thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to come. I'm not the baddest preacher in the world, but I love to preach. And you've had some bad preachers here this month, and I am just so honored to have been included among them. Well, let's go to the Word, shall we? I want you to look with me at Acts, the 25th chapter. Acts, the 25th chapter. In your quiet time, in your time of study, I would invite you to go back and read uh, chapters 20. Four and 25. That will give you the background. I'm going to give you some of that tonight. But you would uh, do well. As a matter of fact, you'd do well to read the entire book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The street is on the grow again, huh? Amen. All right, I can tell. Acts 25, beginning with verse 1. I'm going to read through verse 12, and I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Let me also thank Deacon Smalley because he picked me up. You know that he is uh, the consummate uh, uh, hospitality person. And Mrs. Smalley, I assume that's who you are. I heard the story. <laughs> so good to see you as well. Acts 25. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They urgently requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me and press charges against the man there if he has done anything wrong. After spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I'm guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them, I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. Look at your neighbor and say, enough is enough. <laughs> enough. <laughs> I've had enough. Enough. Father, let the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight because you, O oh God, are our strength and our redeemer. And the people who love God said amen. amen. There comes a time in our lives when we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. We come to a place where we've had enough of sleepless nights and joyless days, of fretting about the situations we find ourselves in, of having people, the circumstances of our lives, and the emotions they evoke dictate to us what we can and cannot do. When we get to that place, when we're tired of worrying, tired of weeping, and tired of waiting, something must be done. Often when we get to this place, most of us would say that we've earnestly prayed about the situation, given it to God, and are now waiting on God to work in a miraculous way on our behalf. 
happen. Have you ever considered the possibility that you are not waiting on God, but God is waiting on you? <laughs> We've all been taught that faith waits and trust on God to handle whatever needs to be handled in our lives. Faith is trusting God, but faith is not always waiting on God. We wait when God tells us to wait. We stand still when God makes clear that we should not move until he says so. But then there are those times when God would have us say enough is enough. Make a decision, bust a move, or give some indication that you are no longer going to take what you've been taking. You're not going to put up with the same old stuff you've been putting up with too long. You are not going to continue the disobedient patterns that have characterized your life. You are done. It never ceases to amaze me how long some of us can stay in a place of pain or misery, a place of emotional, physical, financial, and even mental frustration or sin, unwilling to move because you feel like you are stuck. You do have a choice, you know. You don't have to continue to live in a certain way or allow certain things to happen to you. Even when it appears that matters are beyond your control, you still have options. You can decide how long you're going to stay in a place or get out. You can decide how long you're going to allow people to take advantage of you, take your kindness for weakness, continue to play with you, or move and let them find a new toy. You can decide whether or not you're going to remain in financial bondage with limited discretionary funds or get out of debt so that you can use the resources that God has blessed you with to be a blessing to somebody else. I know that some of you find yourselves in a situation where it may appear that you have no choice but to stay. But I've come to encourage you tonight. There's a way up and out of whatever state, predicament, or circumstance you find yourself in. You just have to make up your mind and be clear with whomever or whatever is holding you back that you are not about to take this any longer. It's obvious that the president has had enough of bipartisan bickering and fighting that is hindering the country from finding a suitable solution to the unemployment situation. Two weeks ago, he put Congress on notice that the American people, the poor, the unemployed, the least of these, do not have time to wait on them. It's time to move and approve his jobs, a proposal to do what is best for the people. Now, when we see Paul in this text, Pastor, he has reached that place. Two years ago, he had been transferred to Caesarea by the Calgary on his way to Rome and placed in a prison there. Felix, the Roman governor at the time, arranged a trial before Ananias, the high priest, the Sanhedrin, and their attorney. Once again, they brought charges against Paul, accusing him of being a ringleader of an unlawful sect, profaning the temple and stirring up an insurrection against Rome. After hearing Paul's defense, Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, dismissed the proceedings, promising to decide the case at a later time, but he never did. Felix knew that Paul had done nothing wrong. He and his wife, Drusilla, met with Paul on a regular basis, kept calling Paul and inviting Paul to come share his faith with them. They, he kept calling Paul and inviting Paul, hoping that he would offer him a large bribe to let him go. But Paul had too much integrity to do so. Some of us may wonder why Paul didn't just cut a deal. He could have saved himself two years of prison and much hassle if he had just bent the rules a little bit. Uh, lots of folks bend the rules all the time, don't they? Folks lie to their husbands and wives, parents, teachers, and supervisors. No, we don't lie. We just stretch the truth. <laughs> We overlook the immoral or unethical behavior of a family member, friend, colleague, or classmate. We cover those people who need to be exposed, fail to report problems, and question the validity of even disciplining people who are wrong. We take a day off every now and then for R&R &R and call it sick leave. We fudge on our taxes. We ask the cable man, a family member, or a friend to adjust the wiring in our home so that we can add more televisions to our service without paying for it. Am I talking to anybody in the house today? All of us at some time or another have bent the rules because that's the way of the world. 
we obviously forget that, forget that as Christians we represent Christ in the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And people's eyes are on us. Everything we say, everything we do is not just a reflection of who we are, but also who Christ is. What others think about Christ is largely determined by what they see in your life and mine. Paul realized when he was witnessing to Festus that he had to live the life that he was talking about. He had to practice what he preached. So he wouldn't compromise. Touch another neighbor and say, I'm not compromising anymore either. It's going to cost you though. When a new governor, Festus, succeeded Felix, wanting to do a favor for the Jews, Felix left Paul in prison. Well, Festus, the new governor, though considered a just and fair man, still did not further Paul's cause significantly. Like Felix, he wanted to be accommodating to the Jews. So as the new governor, he immediately went to Jerusalem. Roman leaders knew that they needed to have a good relationship with the high priest if they were going to govern the Jews. So Festus met with the high priest and members of the Sanhedrin. They immediately requested that Paul be brought back to Jerusalem to face charges there. They wanted Paul transferred back because they had developed a new plot to ambush him. This is major. One would have thought that their hostility against Paul would have died down or out by now. This is demonic. These folks are operating like Satan. If at first he doesn't succeed in his attempt to tempt you and trap you and entice you, he will be back. Satan is tenacious. We can all take a lesson from him in this regard. He never gives up, no matter what the obstacles are or how hard the struggle. He goes after what he wants with reckless abandonment. He intends to succeed. The enemy is intent on getting God's people and throwing us off track, deterring us from the plan that God has for us. Well, so even when he hits a roadblock, even if he fails, he's just going to double back around and try one more time hallelujah you will remember that satan did not succeed in getting jesus to buy into his devious plan to abort god's plan for his life when he tempted him in the desert but after jesus defeated satan's attempts three times luke says to us in 413 he left him until a more opportune time in other words, Satan retreated, waited for a more favorable or suitable time, and then he came back. I repeat, Satan's temptations, his tricks, his taunts are all designed to distract you, to get you off track and stop you from achieving God's purpose and destiny for your life. Every one of us needs to understand this. Be more discerning and stop getting tripped up by the enemy's tactics. He will use anybody and everybody. Maybe the person who's sitting next to you. It could be your husband. It could be your wife. It could be your best friend. It could be your child. It could be somebody who you least expect. He'll use anything and any let me show you what I mean. He will distract your prayer and study life so that spiritually you don't have the insight and power to accomplish what God has designed for you. He will tempt you to take shortcuts rather than operate in excellence so that you will not do your best and have the best. He will seduce you to tie up your funds with increased need and greed so that you won't have the resources to produce wealth and the freedom to tithe and be a blessing to God and others. He wants to see you strung out emotionally in love or lust with the wrong person under the control of somebody who does not fully appreciate who you are, what you need, how you need to be treated, how you should be talked to. You need to know by now that you need to stop messing around with second best. A little something is not better than nothing, baby. What you're running with is going to stop you from getting what God really has for you. And here you keep on dibbling and dabbling, showing up in church, hoping that it won't show 
but it's showing all over you that you don't have what God wants for you to have because you are playing second fiddle to a fool. Hallelujah. Satan is out to get you by any means necessary. Some of you are looking at me and saying to yourself, I'm not into all of that. But let me help you to understand that he'll have you running around like a chicken with your head cut off, busy, majoring in the minors, fooling with things that really don't matter, that are insignificant while missing the greater things in life. He'll even try to stop you physically, tying you down with sickness and disease, unnecessary body weight incurred by undisciplined eating and lack of exercise that will lead to even even greater challenges. Uh, somebody's going to hear me up in here tonight. I'm talking to everybody in the house. It's a demonic attack to stop you from doing what God would have you to do. And the only way to stop him is by taking control of your own life and saying enough is enough and making up your mind that you are no longer going to live beneath your privilege and your opportunity in Christ Jesus. The only way to stop him is to stop him dead in his tracks and stop listening to his invitations and giving in just a little bit, not a whole lot, but just a little dab will do me, you understand? Oh, no, it won't do you. Because God has better for you. Touch somebody and say, God has better for you. Come on, give the Lord some praise. If you believe God wants better for you, give him praise. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Come on. Now, the Jews wanted Paul, and they wanted him bad. Given the fact that Festus was new on the job, they saw this as an opportune time to try and get him again. So they pressed their claims. They urgently pleaded with him to do them a favor and bring Paul back to Jerusalem. Festus wasn't going for it. Paul was in Caesarea where he was going in a few days, and if some of the leaders who had something against Paul wanted to come there and bring charges, they could. Well, the Jews took Festus up on his invitation and followed him back to Caesarea. The next day, Festus convened court, sat down as judge, and brought Paul in. Immediately, the Jews started in on him, bombarding him with their charges. We could tell by Paul's response that they didn't bring anything new. It was the same old stuff. Same old lies to which Paul responded, I'm not guilty. Well, the devil doesn't have any new tricks either. He comes the same old way every time. He tempts us with the same old temptations in our favorite color, in our favorite size, in our favorite flavor. He tries to seduce us with the same old stuff, makes the same old accusations, tells the same old lies, and criticizes the same areas of our life. You see, his aim is to wear us down, to cause us to feel like we are powerless to resist him. So he keeps hitting us at the same spot. We do a little better, get a little control, spend less, eat less, forgive, and try to move on, release the pain only to have some Something happened that takes us right back there again. More undisciplined, frustrated, feeling powerless than ever before. We are not powerless or helpless against the wiles of the enemy, people, and circumstance, our own flesh and emotions. We have the Spirit of God living in us. And the scriptures are the sword of the Spirit that is able to help us stand against the enemy's attacks. Remember when Christ defeated the enemy, he used the scripture, not his own clever thoughts. He read the scripture. And the word of God defeated the enemy every time. Hallelujah. But can I help you to understand it's not just what the word of God does to Satan when he hears it that is so powerful, but what it does in and for us as we hear it and read it and speak it and meditate upon it. The word of God has power. What it does on the inside of us is incredible. The word of God makes us wise, discerning, confident, strong, steadfast, and immovable. So we are able to stand up against the devil's schemes. The word of God builds faith and 
and confidence in us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God encourages us. The word of God tells us the weapon formed against us shall prosper. The word of God tells us that he will meet all of our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. The word of God tells us that we are the head and not the tail. We are the lender and not the borrower. The word of God reminds us that we are our father's sons and daughters. We are children of the king. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him and so it belongs to us. The word of God encourages us and keeps us. One of the ways that the enemy likes to derail some of us is through criticism and accusations and lies. The charges that the Jewish leaders kept raising against Paul were not true. Nevertheless, you and I both know that it's discouraging, it's demoralizing to keep hearing them. It hurts your heart to be continually criticized. It can make you question yourself, doubt your ability, fail to press ahead in the things that you know God has for you because you don't believe that you deserve them. You don't believe that you can achieve them. You began, when you hear these things, you began to say to yourself, maybe it's true. Maybe what they're saying about me is true. But I want to know tonight, whose report are you going to believe? I shall believe the report of the Lord. What does God say? say about me you gotta know who you are and who you are stop walking around with your head hung down stop walking around acting like you don't know who you are stop walking around act being intimidated by everybody else you need to know how fierce you are you are fearfully and wonderfully made there's nobody in the world like you You don't have to apologize for being who you are. You are intelligent. You are smart. You are good looking. You do have things under control. Hallelujah. You are not perfect, but you are forgiven in the name of Jesus. You got to act like you know. Stretch your stuff and act like. The world belongs to you because it does. When people criticize you, don't hang your head. Don't tuck your tail. Stand up straight and look in them in the eye. We have to learn to refuse to get caught up in the emotion of the charges. Don't take it personally even when it is personal. When you try to refute them, stay with the facts. Tell the truth with a clear conscience. Don't ever surrender or quit. Don't let the enemy see you give in or give up. Don't become impatient and bitter. Stand firm on the promises of God. God said he would refute the lies and the accusation of the enemy. I don't have to justify who I am. Hallelujah. I don't have to make any, any, I don't have to prove anymore who I am. Once upon a time, I struggled with low self-esteem, you understand, because people said that I would never be anything. But now I understand the attack of the enemy. He saw then where I was going. He knew then what God had for me. He peeped into my future, just like he's peeped into yours, and see what God is up to in your life. That's why he's working so hard. Hallelujah. To stop you but he can't because what God has determined for you was written hallelujah before the foundation of the world and it shall come to pass he who began a good work in you hallelujah he's gonna bring it to fruition The Jews brought some serious charges against Paul. They were trying to take him back. But Paul had to say to himself, enough is enough. How many times can you say, I'm sorry? 
when you've done nothing wrong? How many times can you cry over the same thing? How many times can you get caught up in the same mess? Enough. Listen to what Paul says when Festus asked him if he'd be willing to go back. Go back where? <laughs> if he'd be willing to go back to Jerusalem to stand trial again. Do you understand he'd been on trial three times? How many times we gonna put, you going to put me on trial? You do understand that when somebody has been offended by you, when somebody has been angered by you, that it's important for you to listen to them to try to resolve the issue. We listen to them. We try to reason with them. We might even apologize that they feel that way. But I can't keep hearing you tell me the same old problem and the same old pain over and over again. After a while, it's no longer my problem, it's yours. Hallelujah! I can't be responsible for people who don't like me because of who I am. Hallelujah! The enemy hates us. Let's get over it and move on. Hallelujah. He got a few other people who hate us, but let's get over that and move on. Said, I'm standing at this moment before Caesar's bar of justice where I have a perfect right to stand. And I'm going to keep on standing, he said, right here. I've done nothing wrong to the Jews, and you know that as well as I do. I've committed no crimes, but if I have committed one, name the day, I can face it. But if there's nothing to their accusation, accusations and you know there isn't, nobody can force me to go along with this nonsense. We have fooled around here. Some of us got that same testimony. I have fooled around here long enough. I keep going round and round and round and round in circles. Hallelujah. We're like the children of Israel who turned an 11-day trip, a 40-year, the 11-day trip into a 40-year one. Look at your neighbor and say, how long you been in the mess you been in? <laughs> how long? Paul had taken all that he was going to take. If he had done anything wrong, he had no problems paying for it. But he wasn't going to stay in this same place. He said, I fooled around long enough. There comes a time when every one of us must say enough is enough. I fooled around long enough. There's some areas in my life where I've allowed Satan, my own flesh, other people, and circumstances to control. Some of us know we need to be through, but we've gotten comfortable in our misery. We're afraid to move because we don't know what's ahead. God keeps telling us, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. Aren't you ready to possess all that God has for you? Aren't you ready to move into the promised land? 
Aren't you ready to move into the abundance that God has already given you? Then you got to let some stuff go. Nothing and nobody should be able to control your life and hinder you from having all that God has for you. Once you've said enough is enough, you don't have to defend yourself. You don't even have to give anybody an explanation why you're checking them off your list. You don't have to tell Satan where you're going. As a matter of fact, some of us want to announce it. No, just move out quickly, hallelujah, and move out quietly. Leave your stuff there because what you left there ain't going to be important to you where you're going. In <laughs> where you going anywhere? Just leave your stuff right there. God's got whatever you need on the other side. He's got everything you need where he's taking you. So don't leave nothing. Don't take nothing with you. When you move. You know what happened to Lot's wife when she looked back? Touch your neighbor and say, she's still at the same place she was when she... <laughs> at the same... Touch your neighbor and say, I don't want that to happen to you. <laughs> Come on here, move, 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 move. I want to leave you on a high, but I want to tell you this. What keeps some of us from moving on is that we really don't know what's up ahead. Do you, you understand? I might not like this, but I know what this is. <laughs> if I leave him... What I'm going to have over there? Well, I don't know, but it's worth seeing, going and seeing what you might. <laughs> See, Paul knew that there would be more trouble, more persecution, possibly death. But it was worth it to receive what God had promised him. When you know the promises of God, then you know that it's worth it to leave what you got behind and go where God is leading. Some of us need to dump some stuff. Old habits, old attitudes. We want to blame it on other people, but the problem is really with us. We are trash collectors. We'll pick up somebody else's trash. That's not that other person's fault. That's it's my fault. God needs to change my heart. And so what I want to ask you tonight to do is to dump that old stuff. Let's dump it in a safe place. Right here. I can't trust you to go out and do side and do it. I need you to do it. Why, do I, why would I say that? Because I know myself. I know myself. You let me out of here, I might not deal with this stuff. This is a safe place. Because what God does with all of our stuff, our hurt, our pain, our guilt, our shame, our condemnation, our unforgiveness, our greed, 
our insecurities, our foolishness. He throws it into the sea of forgetfulness and forgiveness and remembers it no. And whom the sun says free, you better know it. When he sets you, anybody got any stuff you want to dump so you can go to the place where God is trying to take you, come to the altar and let's pray.